what is the anomaly that you see yeah okay batman someone is saying what are titans okay parish rao is a man with sunglasses yeah right i think few of you got it so why are these anomalies right uh, nothing has been written in this picture it doesn't say anything why do you why did you you know end up saying uh, that's that's actually a character from a bollywood movie by the way for people who are not from india uh, the guy with the white topi or cap uh, that's babu rao uh, who's an indian actor and is batman right so these two characters seem to be anomalies in this picture and that is because without any labels without any uh, you know title of the picture we can make exactly they seem to be out of place right they we can make it out that most of the characters belong to marvel except these two so that, that this is very intuitive for us to say that okay these two are the anomalies in this entire picture so moving forward to now this is very intuitive for us right but for machines and for other things we we really need to go into first what is the anomaly detection right and what is what exactly is anomaly detection in time series data that was just a picture so first let's talk about time series data we see time series data literally everywhere time series are nothing but observations that we see uh, you know with time changing with time or being recorded with time it could be anything starting from your a uh, smart watch monitoring how many steps you take in a day uh, or um, you know your <coughs> daily you know laptop usage or your screen time these are all nothing but recordings or with time right so why um, so what is anomaly detection in time series what could be an anomaly in a time series right? so consider a particular day when you just um, you know walked a lot you had to walk a lot and suddenly your number of steps just just increases for a particular day that's kind of anomalous given that uh, from a context perspective right from a pattern perspective so anomaly detection in time series is nothing but an unusual pattern or a unusual instance which is not expected or different from your normal for one day when you walked a lot or a day you had fever right or a day when uh, the city recorded a very high temperature uh, these are all not expected or not normal of course normals do change with time i mean if if we consider data right from you know 1900s to 2023 you'd see that even uh, there is an entire trend that has been going with it so um yeah i mean here is an example about gamestop frenzy so there was a, a group of young retail investors who bought the gme stock such uh, you know they wanted to get back at those uh, big hedge funds and they drove the price way up so if you look at the uh, chart right here you see this this huge spike in february 2021 this sudden but spike that we see is actually anomalous given if you look at the context of this entire time period right it was too high for it to be true so this would uh, this would be nothing but an anomaly in a time series and and these kind of anomalies are something that we want to detect it could be either to get rid of the outliers or get rid of the unexpected or abnormal behaviors when you're doing some kind of modeling on top of the data or it could be wanted anomalies which which are nothing but uh, anomalies that you want to know more about and uh, why did this anomaly occur right uh, if it's uh, something uh, related to you know people buying some kind of sweets or some kind of clothes on um, on amazon in you know around black friday or around some holidays or a, you know really good travel time so the the company wants to know why is this is this is this an anomalous behavior is is this a right time for me to you know for us to reach out to the customers and give them more offers so that we can get more traffic on our website and so on 
Great. So having said this, we can move on to the real world use cases or the where or why is this anomaly detection important, right? And least to say, anomaly de detection is influencing business decisions across all verticals. Um, start as we mentioned earlier, right? Right from manufacturing processes where sensor data is recording very critical data. It could be, you know, um, anomaly detection can help in uh, detecting some device failure or it could be very uh, because there is a so if you think about it right if you talk about turbines um, and these turbines have sensors attached to them which help us detect or which help us capture the vibrations of the components in the turbine this sensor data that changes with time is this sensor data which is changing with time right if there is some malfunction in the turbine these vibrations that are being captured by the sensor data would be very high or there would be some kind of difference that we would observe something similar to the spike that we saw in the gamestop frenzy time series back in the previous slide so this kind of spike is something that we want to capture so that later on we uh, we do not face some loss of uh, later on we do not face losses because if there is a malfunction in some or the other part of the turbine which is already indicated by the sensor but we did not pay attention to it or because it was just too difficult for a person to go through that entire data you know anomaly detection helps us to avoid that loss or at least alert us well in time uh, if you talk about healthcare, right? these days there are so many uh, healthcare monitoring applications starting from wearables to, um, you know, heart rate monitoring and so on. This is all time series data where we can, you know, detect anomalies. Talk about social media where market sentiment analysis is such a huge uh, uh, field, right? where uh, market research and market sentiment analysis where we try to find how is the how are the reviews or what is the behavior of the consumers in a particular time period um, are consumers not happy about a particular brand or are consumers really hyped up about certain things you know there was a time when people were buying a lot of spinners if you guys remember right there was so many people buying those spinners so if we know that this is the current situation in the market or you know this is the current cu customer uh, sentiment about a particular product we can design our marketing campaigns accordingly right talk about smart houses and anything so back in my college we developed an advanced surveillance system right the advanced surveillance system was uh, where we wanted to detect uh, if there is a fire or if there is some unwanted uh, uh, you know person entering or so on so in that we had a temperature sensor the temperature sensor was helping us detect whether there is a very sharp un, uh, you know unexpected rise in the temperature and so on so here we see the different verticals telecom telecom social media transportation where we can also monitor traffic video surveillance finance and insurance of course fraud detection is a huge huge application of anomaly detection so the it's fair enough to say that anomaly detection is very important and influences business decisions across all the verticals right so now that we know the importance of anomaly detection and why do we need to uh, detect anomalies and where all can we detect anomalies we could talk about how right how do we detect these anomalies so moving to how do we detect these anomalies so there are we could broadly divide or you know categorize anomaly detection techniques into two huge brackets one is the probability based approaches and second are the machine learning based approaches probability based approaches use make use of uh, techniques like uh, you know, simple statistical values like mean, median, interquartile range, z scores, p tests, etc. Right. So, outlier detection using means, quartiles based method is again based on median. Uh, simple moving average is another uh, approach or technique uh, 
which where we have a window defined right where um, we look at the previous n number of days and try to see hey, is today anomalous compared to the last 7 days uh, and similarly is exponential moving average hidden markov models and elliptical envelope and today we find libraries and packages which help us detect anomalies using each of these approaches very easily um we would definitely go into one of them uh, today given the scope of today's session um yeah moving on let me just look at the q and a session uh, q and a section so there's a question by dinesh time series data can be any domain yeah so it literally could be any domain right um time series as we talked about smart houses where we are looking at the temperature sensor or we are looking at video surveillance um, that is a time series data anything that is changing with time any value that is changing or being recorded with time even if it's not changing or if it's constant but something that's been recorded with time if anomalies repeat over the period of time series then it becomes a regular pattern yep that's true right so if we look at the all right yeah so if you look at a particular time series um where every day you are let's let's just talk about screen time all right so if you if you talk about screen time there is um, a spike in your screen time say probably when you wake up or like an hour after that and then again there's a probably a spike at your lunch hour then there's a spike at the uh, you know after dinner where you're watching some series or something on your phone uh, because that's when you finally get the time to look at your phone so if this is happening literally every day right it's a daily but it's a daily anomaly you could say that but if you look at a collective or a contextual a uh, collective point of view it's not really an anomaly because it's a period uh, it's something that's been repeated over every time period right so this kind of um, time series this is this is exactly uh, why anomaly detection in time series isn't straight forward in anomaly detection in time series we need to make uh, there are three things that we need to consider right the seasonality the trend um, and the differencing aspect of it so here in when we talk about uh, anomalies at time they become like a pattern so when you want to detect anomalies in this pattern you need to first deseasonalize it or depatternize it such that these kind of things are removed and only the residual uh, is left over over which you will be performing your anomaly detection all right so if you moving on to the machine learning based approaches right so there are a lot of approaches that we see in anomaly detection in fact when i was preparing the presentation for today or for this webinar um now i realized one thing that is we say that anomaly detection techniques right so if you think about it these techniques are not really anomaly detection techniques they they are more of a way of finding anomalies they are more of methodologies because if you think about it if you talk about the machine learning based approaches the forecasting based approach so what exactly is forecasting right we'll be talking more about it in the next slide but just to get you started or just to give you a basic idea forecasting is a use case where you want to forecast the sales of a store or where you want to forecast the um hey, how is is how is my stock going to look like in the future and how how are my sales going to look like in the future how are my consumers going to react in the future and so on so forecasting is actually a machine learning problem and we are trying to detect anomalies using forecasting similarly auto encoders and rnns these are more neural, these are neural networks that you could say for example auto encoders are used for dimensionality reduction used in many different cases many different use cases the main use of auto encoders is dimensionality reduction or feature extraction they are using that 
or we we've kind of figured out a way of how to use auto encoders to detect anomalies so is clustering so is tree based so this is something that i just found out or just you know thought about today that hey there are a lot of techniques um here and uh, what we are doing is we are we are saying that hey using this machine learning technique how can i find anomalies right so right uh, as we were talking about the machine learning based approaches so forecasting based approaches where we be forecasting a time series and then saying that hey based on my forecast this doesn't seem to be aligning with uh, my forecast and probably that's the reason this is an anomaly or it could be an anomaly we need to go back and check um similarly we have neural network based uh, approaches where there are auto encoders self organizing maps and recurrent neural networks these are different uh, neural networks or ways of using neural networks to detect anomalies um uh, clustering based anomalies uh, anomaly detection we have k means db scan which uses a which is a density based uh, clustering technique we have gaussian mix, mix uh, gaussian mixture models which are again used uh, where you know there is a lot of normal uh, norm normal data expected we have tree based approaches these are literally regression models or regression and classification trees that we use in our machine learning use cases or for classification and regression which we use to detect anomalies we'll be talking more about this also then there we have dimensionality reduction dimensionality reduction is basically nothing but we are trying to figure out or we are trying to get our features into a less dimension or a space with less number of dimensions or you know reduce the total number of features and when we are trying to do this we really need to identify what are important uh, features and what are not so in that case uh, you know we find uh, anomalies in this technique we talk more about this in the next slides and lastly we have the proximity based uh, machine learning approach where we try to find using the distance between two points whether a particular point is an anomaly or not all right so now that we've talked about these approaches from a uh, you know overview standpoint maybe we could just deep dive into how exactly do these machine learning based approaches work right and please feel free to drop questions in the q and a box i know there are a lot of questions but i'll try to address them as we move forward um, also because it's a little bit of a deep dive uh, we will probably get into a little more technical stuff so please continue putting out your questions uh, and i'll try to answer them when you know i can after completing every one technique i can go back to the q and a box uh, based on the time we have left all right so starting with the first uh, technique for anomaly detection we have the stati we start with the statistical approach or the probability based approach where we are trying to find the outliers right so how do we find these outliers um there are a lot of probability based approaches and here i've just taken the example of the interquartile range uh, which um yeah so just to explain the interquartile range right let me just unmute it yeah so here this this line that you see is our upper limit this line that you see is our lower limit and this is our value that has been changing with time right with every literally every day so what do we do when we are trying to find the outlier in this data and using a statistical approach we'd be calculating the interquartile range this interquartile range is q3 minus q1 just so q3 is nothing but our upper quartile and q1 is our lower quartile what exactly does lower quartile mean is that 25% of our data belongs to the lower or if you okay let me just unmute it over here if we if we if we were to you know plot the distribution of our data and if we talk about the interquartile range right if this is our median this is our minimum value that we see over here and this is our maximum value that we see over here so we have we have 25% of the data between the minimum and the lower quartile or q1 we have 25% of the data or you could say 75% of the data from this end but 
this is our q3 which is nothing but our higher quartile upper quartile using these quartiles what exactly do these quartiles tell us we could yeah this is another you know way of visualizing where exactly is q1 and q q3 um lie and once we calculate this iqr right we um we calculate our upper limit and lower limit the upper limit is calculated using this formula and here what exactly does this upper limit and lower limit tell us is hey the data based on the entire data points that you have given me or that we've observed historically the data should lie somewhere on this distribution right in between these two points the data point or value should lie somewhere between these two distribution the, these two lines or these two limits if any value or any sample is exceeding the particular limit it could be somewhere it could be down as well but for this case since we see it moving up this is an anomaly right and this is a very straightforward approach um and also the value 1.5 is nothing but a scale that is something that we choose or we define based on the data distribution right to be honest this entire technique is used or does assume that it's a you know the there's not a lot of variation if there is a lot of variation if you see there is a lot of uh, you know outliers in this data we'd see that the quartile range changes so it might not be a full proof way but it's definitely a way that has a way or a technique that has been going on for a long time and uh, something that does help us identify anomalies in a very straightforward or in a direct way another statistical approach which is very widely used is also the using the z score z score is nothing but the number of standard deviations a sample is above or below the mean i'm assuming that everyone here knows uh, standard deviations if not we could just quickly talk about it so assume the same distribution right in the same distribution if this is my mean right so my standard deviation is nothing but right so my standard deviation is nothing but how much is how much is seven Five percent, sixty-three percent of my data, or you know, sixty-six point six percent of my data. Where is sixty-six percent of my data located? Right. So this is where the standard deviation lies. So this, so this is how the standard deviation is calculated. So the number of standard deviations a sample is above or below a mean is how we calculate a z-score. for every sample we could calculate a z score which would give us that hey this particular point is this much different from the expected behavior and if there is a, if you are using or going forward with a z scores to calculate uh, the anomalies the z score actually gives us a probability or a probability value of how different um, or how away a particular point is from its expected behavior and we again use another threshold to point out which is an anomaly just like we use a scaling factor of 1.5 over here so just to summarize what we discussed in in this particular approach the samples which are lying outside the upper and the lower limit or these bounds that we've calculated are flagged as anomalies in this particular approach right or so if we move to the next approach we just quickly check the okay let me okay is the presentation visible or probably not visible for a few folks all right uh, so there's a are we going to apply all these things in reference to time series oh i think this is the question regarding the different machine learning approaches so clustering I mean we could definitely use the techniques from a time series uh, in a time series data but most importantly or you know if you look at uh, 
the statistical approach or the ARIMA, these are more time series based uh, anomaly detection techniques. Clustering and eye forest is something that can be used also for you know, non time series data or just a uh, data that we have. But yes, we have used, um, in, in my experience, we have used this on a real world data, uh, these techniques, including the clustering, including the uh, isolation forest or the tree based approaches. And we do uh, see that valid or real anomalies are detected right all right if i look at the another question presence of anomalies are forecasting becomes less effective then let me cover forecasting and then probably we can take up this question right how to read seasonality and trend from this diagram so I, I'm not sure if you're talking about this particular diagram in the IQR method that the slide that's open, but particularly if you want to check the seasonality and trend, we have our ADF and uh, CTF tests that we do, right? Where we can find the seasonality and uh, the trend, and we could also de seasonalize it or de trend it so that we can just have the residual on which we can perform the uh, time series. So, all right, moving forward to the forecasting based approach. All right, so forecasting based method is another method or technique which we can use to detect anomalies. So, what I want to convey in this particular method is how exactly can we use forecasting to predict an anomaly right so if we look at the chart over here so for forecasting we set off some time right it's the learning period where we allow a few weeks uh, to the model for it to learn how the time series is behaving after the learning period, we start plotting our metric value with the with time, right? And here, in my forecasting approach, what would happen is, let's assume that this is a nothing but um, you know how many people are clicking on my ad. This is actually a click through rate chart of a click through rate, right? So how many people? are clicking on my ad if I show them the ad, right? So, yeah. So, if I look at this chart, I, I learned, I let my model or my ARIMA model learn for a particular period of time. Once my model has learned the set behavior, if you look at the metric value, how the metric value is changing, right? The blue is the metric value on my click-through rate and the yellow is the forecast that my model is predicting that, hey, at this week, probably the value should be this much. This week, the value would be this much and so on. So if you look at it, the forecasting value is pretty much accurate, right? The forecasting model seems to be working really well. But how do I use my forecasted value to detect whether there is an anomaly? So here you'd see the there is a confidence interval, the gray area, which is my confidence interval, my max confidence interval and my minimum confidence interval. These are bounds for my forecasted value. What I'm saying is, hey, I'm 99% sure that my for the real value will not go beyond this forecasted value, right? So if it will not go beyond this forecasted value, and I'm really confident in my forecasting model, if my true value or my metric value, which in this case did go out, right, here, it did go out. I was predicting in this particular week, I was predicting based on the previous historical data, I was predicting that the value would be somewhere here. But it turned out that there was a peak. So it went outside of my confidence interval or bounds of my metric uh, of my forecast right 
So here is an anomaly. Summarizing this particular concept, a prediction or an anomaly <coughs> in the forecasting model is such that the, the real value or a prediction or a real value is falling out of my confidence interval, right? Confidence interval of my forecasted value. Now, what are these forecasting models? There are a lot of time series forecasting competitions and there is M4, M5 time uh, forecasting that's going on. There's pandemic forecasting, the sales forecasting. There's so many uh, forecasting models that go around, right? So, if you talk about uh, a very simple yet very popular uh, forecasting model that is ARIMA, Auto Regressive Integrated Moving Average. So it's a statistical model which is um, which is built upon nothing but our previous observations. So the previous observations are what are used. It's a univariate, uh, right? It's a univariate model. Basically, it works only on a time series data or a one particular feature. If you talk about sales, you're just going to include sales. My my previous sales is what I'm going to fit my model on. That's the data that I'm going to use to train my model. So the previous sales, the previous um, um, observations are used to find out what is going to be my next value. The, uh, the difference between these observations and there's a moving window value which is used to determine the lag observation. So the acronym, right, ARIMA. Um, as you can find it written over here, ARIMA is descriptive or this acronym is descriptive of the components. The previous observations that are used to perform regression is the autoregressive part, part of it. The observation values are replaced by the difference between them, right? So instead of directly using the values, we are using the difference between these values. And there is a moving window or a lag that we consider. That's called a lag order, right? So these are also parameters, P, Q, D, that we use in uh, a time series forecasting model. If we want to, yeah, we could go through the code too, but I think we might not be able to cover everything if we go through the code as well. Um, but yeah. If, if instead of going into the depth of ARIMA, right, let me just talk about the seasonality um, concept around it. So ARIMA does have parameters that you can pass, which you can, you know, uh, pass based on whether a particular time series is seasonal or not, right? So these values, uh, PQD, are determined using different kind of tests. And for the minimum uh, you know, minimum error score, we uh, come up with the right or the optimal parameters that we pass into this ARIMA model. Now, there are a lot of other techniques or you could say auto, um, you know, automatic models where you don't have to look at the time series every now and then and figure out, hey, what would be the optimal parameters that I send for this ARIMA model, right? Uh, so, instead of that, there, there are, uh, Facebook has come up with this, um, module or package called profit right fb profit so fb profit is something that uh, is nothing but based on the arima model and which predicts uh, it does take in whether it gives you an option to enter whether there's a yearly seasonality whether there's a daily seasonality that it needs to consider it, it, what is the interval width or what is the window that it should consider and then it will fit the model or the profit model to detect anomalies and to first forecast whether the forecasting, uh, with how the sales is going to, you know, uh, look like in the future, or and then we use this forecast and its confidence interval to come up with or to detect the anomalies. Let me quickly share the code because that would give a good. Uh, yeah, that would give a better idea. So, if you talk about the forecasting rate, so from FB Profit, uh, we're importing this. There is a data, a catfish, this is a catfish sales data from 1986 to 2012, where we just have the sales value uh, for every particular month. Uh, so, it's a monthly data from, from 1986 to 2012. 
And if we look at the way I've defined this model as we um, have our parameters that we pass in the profit model, right? We fit our data on this. We predict what would be the next. So yes, in ARIMA or in forecasting, right? Let's assume that oh, I think we might have a chart in the bottom. Yep. So right. So in this um, plot that you see, right? What exactly uh, I want to convey is with every moving time period, there is a trend. There is a monthly trend or a yearly trend that we are seeing. How would we exactly? detect anomalies that we were doing forecasting right so it's actually an iterative process so to detect whether there are anomalies in this particular batch we would train our model on this much time right we forecast for this if this is my present day where i want to check if there is an anomaly or not I trade my data on this much time. I keep some time window. And then I forecast these values. I'd say, hey, let's assume, let's talk about the mean over here. If this is my forecast, this is my confidence interval. And it seems like this point is completely outside the, you know, my confidence interval. Hey, this is an anomaly, right? So it's more of an iterative process. Now, when I come here next, I want to train my data till this point in time, forecast for this particular period, and then check that hey, over here, it is still in the range. So probably no anomalies that I see in this, right? And so on, it's like, it's more of an iterative process, which will keep going. So if you look at the code as well, sorry. If you look at the code as well, we keep, um, you know, we keep going back and forth to detect the anomalies, right? We're predicting, we're checking what is the, if there is a, what is the upper limit? What is the lower limit? And if it's above the limit, we're saying it's an anomaly. All right, moving to the next method. So auto encoders. All right. I think auto encoders is something that are widely used across different techniques, be it mainly especially NLP and graph based approaches, right? So what are auto encoders made of? They're nothing but neural network models that seek they want to learn a compressed or they want to output a compressed representation of the input. So if I were to pass a very huge data set with a ton of features, right, for suppose from X1 to X100, these are my features that are that I'm passing as the input to this particular layer. What I want my auto encoder to do is to put it in to represent it in a latent space, to encode it into something which is easier for me to understand, maybe, you know, just a five length vector, just, just for an example. All right. So, yeah, auto encoders are neural network models. And then what they're doing is we are kind of extracting the main features, which represent the different patterns in the data and uh, we, we're encoding it. There are two parts to auto encoders. Right? One is a encoder part and another is a decoder part. The encoder part does the extraction, does the encoding, and the decoder does the decoding, and you could say the reconstruction of the input again. So these two parts are helping us in reducing dimensionality, in extracting important patterns and important features. How do we use this in anomaly detection? Right. So if you think about it, when I'm sending some inputs to this particular neural network model, I'd get the particular code, right? If you just talk about, let's talk about images for now. Okay. Suppose, 
Third is my first image. Say it's just a number one. Third is my second image that I just sent as an input to the input layer or to the encoder, right? I want my decoder to give the same image or the most similar representation of the image, right? I think even my annotation is going to work like an auto encoding. But yeah, so this this is exactly not same, but it is very similar. So what my decoder will do is nothing but again give me the same input or a similar input. What how do we use this in anomaly detection? So auto encoders have when we are when we have suppose we represented this as one zero one one zero very vague example but if you if this was my code for one and when it started deconstructing this to generate my one right there was some error there was a reconstruction error that we saw this error is what we use in anomaly detection Let me draw one more example. Okay. There is a two, and there's another one again. Okay. This is very weird, very weird one. So suppose here the error that we saw was just for you know sake of example, if the error that we saw was around one percent. Okay, here the error was 1.1%. And here there is a 3% error. And this error is nothing but a reconstruction error. I think somewhere I have it written. Yep. It's a reconstruction error. So what is happening over here is if I look, if I if if I send an entire batch of samples and my reconstruction error ranges somewhere between one to two percent, right? Which is which is my bound. But then I see that hey, for this particular sample, the reconstruction error is looking somewhere around three percent. This is anomalous, right? There's probably some problem in the data where where my auto encoder is facing challenges to find the error uh, to find to not find the error but where my auto encoder is facing challenges to recreate the input that i sent right so this is how auto encoders this is how we use uh, we do anomaly detection for auto using auto encoders so there are a lot of type of auto encoders and uh, as the uh, let me just cover this yeah so they're unsupervised learning methods but um, because they're trained with the because we know the classification and everything because they're trained using su supervised learning methods they're referred to as self-supervised um, and as as we discussed or as i mentioned in this method uh, in this uh, technique the samples which show very high reconstruction error compared to the nominal error that we observe for the normal samples are flagged as anomalous. All right. So let me just take a look at the Q&A session. Oh, Q&A section. Okay, we have a lot of questions. Presence of anomalies. Oh, that's right. Let me just CTR prediction research. Yeah, so the CTR prediction research, uh, the chart that I showed was actually using the uh, Numenta anomaly, uh, this thing that is a CTR data available publicly. I can add in the references for that. Um, I can definitely share the link to this notebook. I know it's a little technical intensive and we're almost towards the tail end of the session. Um, I will definitely share the notebook and I'll also try to share, uh, see if we can share the deck with you guys. Um, 
and yes encoder works very similar to pca uh, because it's nothing but a dimensionality reduction right in pca also we are doing the same thing the the only um, difference in an auto encoder and a pca is auto encoder works better for non linear and because it has non linear components in the neural network right so it it can take care of more complex data uh, and uh, and that's why we do prefer auto encoders over pca for complex data uh, data sets but pca is a more straightforward or like, you know uh, approach that directly uses dimensionality reduction we look at the next question what's the error confidence to be considered as an anomaly the error confidence to be considered as an anomaly is something that depends on the data right um, you need to first do a proper eda of the entire data and based on that we can define whether a particular uh, scale or a threshold um, would be fair or good enough for a date uh, for your anomaly detection errors as anomalies at the time of model prediction could you please clarify factor interpreting errors so all right so i guess the question is let me read out the question interpreting errors as anomalies at the time of model prediction not in a very straightforward way right uh, the errors is it what we are saying is when we do a back propagation in neural networks right we calculate the error we use a loss function we want to minimize the loss function our loss function or our error that we see on every sample would definitely be between a certain range uh, and if it's a, and if there is an outlier or an anomaly in the data the loss or the error calculated for this particular sample is going to be abnormally high so this error indicates that hey this particular sample just uh, for which i see a very high reconstruction error is actually a anomaly right what type of anomalies can be detected in social media data mm. so social media data this is, there is there is so much scope in social media data right if we talk about tweets we can uh, we have consumer sentiment on tweets uh, we have uh, uh, in social media there are so many ads that we come across there are so many uh, you know personalized ads suggested ads that we look at all right so these all are uh, uh, data time series data where a company or someone or the other is tracking how you are behaving with a particular ad and uh, if you are you know uh reacting to a particular ad for example you clicked on some ads for some ads you didn't that just means that hey uh, out of 100 people 90 people clicked on a sunscreen ad in the summer whereas uh, only 15 people clicked on a sunscreen ad in the winter right so this is more of a wanted anomaly which i want to know that hey people are inclining to start buying or you know uh, sunscreen that's why they're clicking on these ads so i want to take note of this anomaly and i want to design my marketing campaign in such a way right so yeah uh, all right i think we have a very less we have almost 2 minutes left and we've also tried to answer a lot of questions quickly want to take you through a last two techniques one is a clustering based techniques where we're, not, we're doing nothing but you know clustering um the data points that we have and if most of whatever uh, yeah let's just go through the ideal or idea of the methodology right if the samples lie outside the defined clusters then they are labeled as anomalies we are assuming that the nominal or the normal values would be present in a particular cluster and there would be very few whatever are the few Uh, points which are not present in the cl cluster are probably anomalies, and of course, in anomaly detection, one thing that we need to uh, take into account is it's a very um, you know risky process that you do need to go back and check whether hey, this point does it seem anomalous, does it make sense to me or not, or to the company or to the uh, to for 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 the particular data or anything for whoever you're doing anomaly detection. and the last is a tree based on isolation forest approach where uh, you know this is a very effective uh, algorithm uh, which is uh, 
used for detecting anomalies and it's simply based on the fact of fewness two two things right fewness and difference the uh, uh, i think this is one of the most easiest uh, techniques where hey anomalies are going to be very few in the entire data and they're going to be different from the normal so how do i say whether a point is an anomaly or not i pick any uh, suppose i'm talking about the sales right and i pick up I, i pick sales and uh, i start splitting it uh, i i'm sure you guys must have heard about binary search trees right we take a mid value and we start uh, uh, taking a max and a min so when we start splitting it and we find uh, we start splitting it and uh, we find values within the minimums and the maximums uh, there there is a tree ensemble which is composed you know by averaging all the trees in the forest and if the outliers are very different or diverging they pre- they're present on the extreme ends of the data the eye forest uh, is going to say that it's a anomalous data right and i think we're almost on time uh, we did answer a uh, a lot of questions and i think there are a lot more questions uh, all right how does an omni detection in time series utilize forest regression integrated auto encoder dimensionality um so time series data is for time series anomaly detection auto encoders arima and statistical approaches are uh, three approaches which are very uh, important because they take care of the contextual aspect uh, like we were talking about the catfish sales right which had been increasing since 1986 so this and so if you talk about data or the trend being increased uh, seem keeps increasing from for every year we know that hey this because it's been increasing in, with time it's not an anomaly but if there is a particular spike in the same year then that's an anomaly so these techniques that we just discussed help us in identifying those spikes and ignoring uh while not ignoring but while considering the contextual aspect of time series all right i think um we did try to cover a lot of technical uh, information in the duration of an hour and uh, time is never enough but um, and we did have a code as well i'll try to check with the um, analytics with our team how we can share the code as well and the deck with you guys and uh, thank you for being so supportive and uh, asking so many good questions um and with this let me conclude today's uh, data session on anomaly detection in time series thank you all for your time and support perfect perfect thanks a lot parika on behalf of analytics vidya i would like to thank you for your time and delivering such a wonderful session i am sure our audience found, found it insightful and hopefully we can conduct more such sessions with you in the future definitely thank you thank you for analytics uh, to analytics with there as well for giving this opportunity to me you most welcome parika thanks all right thank you yeah i hope you guys have filled in the feedback poll if not i request you to please fill in the poll about feedback as it helps us to conduct more such sessions and if any of you wish to conduct a webinar or facing any difficulty in registering please do connect with us i'll be sharing the email id in the chat section guys just a second please reach out to us on this email id and we will be conducting more such sessions the next session will be conducted tomorrow that is 3rd of february i'll be providing the link of the upcoming data or sessions you can use this link to you know participate in the upcoming data or sessions it will it will be in the chat section guys
so thank you very much for joining the session we we'll, we hope to see you soon and regarding the presentation and code tanya you can reach out to us on the email provided in the chat section which is data at analyticsvidya.com and we will provide you with all the required information also the recording of the session will be available on our youtube channel in 24 to 48 hours so you can use that as well i have put up a link of the channel you can use this link the name of the channel is analytics vidya there is a playlist called data all right thanks everyone thank you so much for joining the session we hope to see you soon thank you so much